Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this version of our Ash Wednesday service. Um, this is not the way that we had uh, planned this all out. As you know, we were going to be meeting jointly with Zion Evangelical Church um, to have the service at their church, but and due to inclement weather, didn't quite work out that way. But so glad that you tuned in because this is such an important time for us as we begin the season of Lent and then uh, um, prepare, so to speak, for upcoming celebration of the resurrection at Easter. But we want to take time to reflect and to learn and to do some self-examination, not navel-gazing, so to speak, but to really examine ourselves and think about what Lent is truly all about. And I'm not one, by the way, that is a, a big fan of what am I going to give up for Lent. I would rather think about it as um, what am I going to do to more reflect the character of Christ in my life? You know, what am I going to allow God to do through me? And um, what are some things that I need to do maybe to change the way that I'm living my life and, and can be more faithful in, in the future? So um, let us begin then uh, uh, this Ash Wednesday uh, message part of the service. And I want to share with you the text that my message is going to be based on. And it is a psalm, if you will, a psalm number 51. I'm going to read verses 1 through 17 of Psalm 51. Uh, this is a psalm believed to have been written by David. And this is how it reads. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach the wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice hide your hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from your presence and take not your holy spirit from me restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit I said initially I was going to read through verse 17, but I believe I'll stop there at verse 12. In those last couple of verses, you may recognize they come straight out of the liturgy um, where we often um, say that together, those words. So um, at this time, I'd just like to have a prayer with you, um, and we'll go from there. Now let us pray. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them and take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Well, I want to begin this way to say that this psalm, you know, was never meant to be spoken. It was, in fact, meant to be wailed, wailed with the agony of a broken heart, reaching out in desperation. This scripture really is a prayer, most likely originally, again, spoken by King David, uh, after his affair with Bathsheba and his masterminding, if you will, of a secondhand murder. It is, of course, one of the Bible's uglier stories. And scripture is always, it just always takes me aback because scripture is always so honest, does not attempt to hide anything, which to me makes it ever more credible. So David had grown so deeply entangled in the webs of treachery and he sought a way uh, to regain the life that he had lost, you know, and the delight in life that he had lost over um, the course of playing out his sin. His sins were like shadows, blotting out the light that once shone on his skin and warmed him from head to toe. 
the darkness, well, you could say that had really swallowed him up as he had turned from the light and the presence of God. Now he's desperate to find a way back into the warmth of God's sweet grace. I suspect that we can all identify with David because all of us know sin. We're born into it. We cannot avoid it. When David says that he was born in sin, he means he was born human. What does that mean? To be born human is to be prone to sin, and to be a believer uh, is to be human and then try and try again to outrun sin, knowing full well that sin always can be said to run faster. Only one man we know of was above sin, and of course, that man was Jesus Christ. The rest of us have no hope except in God. Uh, Martin Luther once said, A lawyer speaks of the human person as an owner and master of property, and a physician speaks of the person as healthy or sick. But a theologian, you see, a theologian discusses the person as a sinner. So we're all theologians in that respect if we are willing to speak in spiritual terms and talk about sin. In theology, uh, that is the essence of the human person, okay, uh, that we are sinful. But when you think about it, the only time we ever really hear the word sin is when we're in church. Or maybe if you're fortunate enough to be around a, a group of people who really take their spiritual life seriously, and I would say to you that's becoming less and less a probability in this country and in many countries because they are sliding away, slipping and sliding from their Christian heritage. Most of the world, world isn't familiar with the word sin, doesn't tend to frame their humanity, seeing themselves as a sinner um, is what I mean to say. We label ourselves with other names and we oftentimes walk into church uh, I think we're all guilty of this. We slap on a name tag, maybe, that reads sinner, um, so to speak, until we, until we peel it off and throw it away on our way out. You could say that's a cycle of wash, rinse, repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat. That, unfortunately, seems to be our regular pattern, wouldn't you say? Um, the way we treat sin you'd think it was not the least bit significant. You know, God will forgive us anyway, we say, every week, right? So what's the big deal? I go to church on Sunday, and Monday I'm back to life as I knew it before. Nothing much changed. There's a uh, witty commentary by a pastor named Brian Erickson. It caught my attention when he said, Conventional Christianity... Whether we like to admit it or not, understand sin as action and little more. And so what happens? We pray the prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he continues, had David been a member of many modern churches, the psalm might read a little bit differently, you know, maybe more like a laundry list than an existential crisis. There might have been like, uh, mention of a lot of please forgive this God and and that and very little of let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Okay, and I think that captures really a, a more realistic explanation of our approach to sin. If we're honest, we and and this is probably the most significant thing I'll say in this message. And hope you'll remember this. We tend to address the symptoms rather than endure the surgery. One pastor describes an experience several years ago in which she assisted in her first funeral. The deceased had been a dearly loved member of the congregation, and she says that he always made sure to say hello to her every Sunday morning as she was preparing the chapel for worship. She said he was a tall fellow, probably about six foot three or so, and she remembered this, that on the day of his funeral, the pastor with whom she was working in conjunction with handed her a clay jar. About, it was about a foot and a half tall, which was unexpectedly heavy. And, of course, the pastor told her this is the urn. Um, 
person's ashes after crema cremation, and, and, and bear with me for a moment here because I know uh, this is not the most pleasant stuff to hear, but I think it's necessary, especially on uh, a night like Ash Wednesday. But a person's ashes after cremation weigh about 3.5% of their original body weight, um, making you know the ashes around 6 pounds, uh, which, of course, adds to the weight of the urn. And so she says, as we made our way to the memorial garden, her colleague told her that she would be pouring the ashes into a circular hole among the flowers. She didn't tell her any more than that. Now, uh, she remembered the family and how they all gathered in close. And when the time came, she says, I tipped the urn very lightly and began to pour out the ashes. And as they poured, she says, <clears throat> her own mortality suddenly hit her in the face. You see, when someone's cremated, they don't necessarily become all fine ash, but bones and teeth will often remain intact. Uh, and as this uh, matter began to fall into the hole and the finer ash uh, returned upward, it got into her hair and on her robe. She realized that <clears throat> this is the reality of everybody's future, whether cremated or buried, rich or poor, black or white. Man or woman, we all turn into bones and dust in the end. Then occurred to her, this is what we rub on our foreheads, <coughs> sign of a cross, on Ash Wednesday. We rub our futures plainly on our skin for the world to see. We stare, in other words, our mortality in the face when we look at one another. So, if we were doing this as normal, and you were to come forward, and we would be placing the ashen cross upon your foreheads, and we would, as we the you know the pastor or uh, the leader would pronounce uh, as they were looking deep into your eyes that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You know what are we saying? Well, you're going to die. I'm going to die. You're here for this short time. And this black powdery substance, that's what will become of you. How romantic is that in light of the fact that we just celebrated Valentine's Day, right? The same pastor said after the funeral, her colleague came and walked her back into the church, and they took some time to wash what was once a friend's body off of their robes and their hands. She said, they don't warn you about the way that feels when you're in seminary. This pastor had faced much death before, but this was the day when she truly felt the emptiness of a person's absence. She said, it feels like tiny grains of dust in your hair and on your hands that once used to be a living, breathing story of life filled with love. And now, of course, this friend we know wasn't truly dead if they trusted Christ, they were just in the next phase of life. But as we know life now, God gave us this life in the end. What does God do? He claims it back again. So why rub it on our faces anyway? What does that have to do with David and his prayer? Well, in verse 9, he says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Um, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, God reminds Adam, who has sinned against him, that he is dust, and to dust he shall return. In ancient times it became a custom when in mourning or when filled with shame, we would hide our faces by spreading ash and dust all over them. David, in this case, in the psalm, is ashamed. The dust and ash are symbols of his sin, and with each transgression he's died a little more, and he begs God, breathe, O oh God, breathe the sweetness of your grace back into my broken body as he had breathed life into Adam from dust. In our shame, we want nothing more than to be repaired and for our problems to disappear, don't we? And, and I dare ask, have you ever felt so ashamed before God that you wanted to crawl away unnoticed and just Hope that both parties would forget. I know we've all done that with other people and even with, within ourselves. 
But sometimes it can be difficult to imagine this with our relationship with God because we don't know God quite the same way we know other people and other things. But I want you to think differently for a moment or at least think about God as a friend, if you will. One that can touch and you can touch and see, you can hear, you can meet this God for coffee. God is that friend, say, that always listens when you're sad. He's the one that you can call when your car breaks down and you need a ride. He's the friend that says, I love you, before hanging up the phone. Now, imagine breaking that friend's heart. Whether you were doing it on purpose or not, the deed had been done. What do we do? We tend to ignore the problem. Explain simply, imagine this, that you have prepared a steak dinner. You leave the room for a moment, and your dog and your cat devour the steak, and when you return, you find quite the scenario. Your dog, okay? How's this for describing the reality of how some dogs act? Slowly walking towards you, head down, eyes closed, tail between his legs, and just pleading with his cuteness to be loved. The cat is sitting right next to the empty plate, licking his paws, staring at you at the face as though to say, uh, what, <laughs> you think we have a problem here? Your, pet, your pets have sinned, but neither of them truly repents. They both represent the ways, I believe, in which we try and address our sins. We look to restore good feelings, but we don't address the real brokenness. To endure the surgery rather than treat the symptoms, as the Pastor Brian Erickson pointed out, we must truly seek to change within ourselves from the inside out, if you will. Uh, given that opportunity, again, you know that your dog and your cat, if you have them, would eat the steak and repeat their appeals to you and transfer that for a moment to human beings. Isn't that the same thing we do in church? Each week we come back here clean, with a clean slate, with a prayer of confession. We start all over again. We break God's heart over and over and over again. Instead of holding ourselves accountable to our actions, um, you know, the fact that we've sinned against God, we tend to take his grace for granted. Think back for a moment to that man's ashes that were held in the pastor's arms that day and reflect on the person that he was, the memories that were going to be lived on through the life of others, the things he stood for, the example that he made. Think of his face and picture God breathing life into his spirit again as he enters the kingdom. You know, I can just see God smiling and greeting him in all his glory as someone he had come to know throughout the his life while he was here on earth. Now, we all want to be loved. That's what drives us. We want to matter to someone. We want to feel. Some say we cannot know happiness without experiencing sadness. Well, we cannot truly know the depths of our sin or the sting of God's disappointment without first knowing God's love and amazing grace. When we crave God's love and we see what we want in God, then it hits us, okay? The existential crisis like David suffers here. We're broken because we have broken God's heart into a million pieces with every step that we've taken away from it. To treat this then as some flippant you know, thing to be checked off a list to be forgiven and then do the very same thing over and over again has got to break God's heart all the more. Yet his love reaches down and picks up our messes, places us piece by piece back together again to a more beautiful version than what we were just prior. To shatter it again without acknowledging the truth of the hurt that we've caused and trying to change it is an offense to that very grace which is our only hope for salvation. Without God, 
the dust that we are would never have known what it is to live and breathe, to walk, taste, and touch, to love one another, and to give love. We owe everything to our merciful Creator. And all that God asks of us in return is to love. We are to love his creation, okay, to love each other, <coughs> excuse me, to love God's will, and most importantly, to love God. It's incredible that we, humanity, the most ruthless and destructive beings on this earth, have a God that never gives up on us, who wants to be in a selfless relationship with us and will not stop at anything to communicate his love. All he wants in return is for that love to be reciprocated. I think all of us knows, when we think about it, how it feels to yearn to be loved back in a way that we have given love to someone. We know how it can destroy us when that love is not returned. So let me ask, why do we do this to our Creator over and over again? Well, the good news is God accepts our brokenness. He loves us through it. But it is up to us then to truly repent. The ashes of Ash Wednesday and uh, to see that we should do everything we can to treasure our relationship with our God who treasures us. He knows we're helpless. In the words of one seminary professor, it says, remember that you are dust, but remember as well that God remembers. And to remember that God remembers is to find assurance that God is in love with dust, no matter how messy it is. He's in love with dust, our dust. Ash Wednesday dares us to carry our crosses out in the open as though the ashes were on our foreheads always. It dares us to see every breath in our lungs as a precious gift from God. It reminds us that salvation does not come from ourselves. Can never do that. We'll never do that. But that our only hope is in God. We're frail and weak without God to make us strong. And these ashes, well, they humble us. God's church. Okay, I had a picture of God's church here. It's not made of the strong and the perfect, but it's a house of the broken, the cracked, the desperate children of the Lord. And through our brokenness, we will be born into the light of God's sweet grace. Through the cracks in our frames, may that love shine and warm the cold world that we know. And so, hear the psalmist as he says, Create in us a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast away from your presence. I'm sorry, do not cast us away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us in a willing spirit. May God bless your Lenten journey this year and may you be with us as we gather on these Wednesdays in Lent to talk about and to reflect upon our life as dust and the dust that God loves, the dust that is precious, precious to our Lord and from which he died. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlc. M-E-T-R-O dot com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.